Show him what brought you back, Carl. I found this in a limestone deposit dating back to the Devonian age. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 72, which is Cole's choice, so what have you brought to us from the Devonian period? My selection this time is Creature from the Black Lagoon from 1954, directed by Jack Arnold, starring Richard Carlson, Julie Adams, Richard Denning, Antonio Moreno, Whit Bissell, Nestor Paiva, and as the creature, Ben Chapman on land and Rico Browning underwater. This is truly one of the greatest B-movies of all time. It follows a group of scientists as they head deep into the Amazon, following the discovery of a fossilized claw unlike any ever found. In search of more remains, they travel deeper into the Amazon, ending up in the legendary Black Lagoon, unaware that the creature still walks, and swims as he is amphibious, among us. This was the first monster movie I ever saw, and I immediately fell in love. In fact, it's the first movie I think I have a memory of, period. At that age, which for me was six, it makes such an indelible impression. I think it's perfect for kids, actually. While it has some more sophisticated ideas in it, which we will get into, it also works well on a very basic level. There are simple drives and motivations. It's easy for a kid to get. It's scary, but not too scary. It's the perfect Saturday afternoon kids club matinee. There's cool creature design and thrills and chills. I think this was actually the last of the Universal Monsters for me, so I came to it pretty late in life. Which is kind of surprising knowing how obsessed I am with the water and how much I love creature features. Well, this is the first, at least on the show, Universal Monster foray for us. And the Universal Monster Pantheon is one of the most elemental building blocks of my cinematic history. Once I knew of their existence, I sought them all out. I could not wait to get to my late 20s, early 30s to find it out. And it wasn't just the movies, but every associated thing I could find. One of the great joys of my life in second, third grade was when the weekly reader book order forms would come out. Me too. So much. So many great memories. So many great purchases. When that order form hit my desk, I would comb it for every monster-related title that I could find, and it wasn't just books. Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, t-shirts, masks, toys, Aurora models, you name it, I collected it. So before we get into it, for the uninitiated, let's outline the Pantheon. In the silent era, you have the Hunchback of Notre Dame and the Phantom of the Opera, and then picking up in the sound era, Dracula... Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Wolfman, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon. There are other significant films in the early days of universal horror, The Old Dark House being one, for instance, that we did way back in episode two. But for the purposes of this conversation, when I use the phrase universal monsters, I will mean the aforementioned group. So now that you have finally seen them all, do you have a favorite out of the group? A few of them actually vie for my favorite, and it really depends on my mood. But the tops would be The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Wolfman. The Wolfman being such a creep, how does he sneak into your top of the roster? I really like the transformation work. I like that it's also set in the modern period and something kind of other at the same time. I also find it to be really sad. It's not a case of a person's choices being revisited upon them. He didn't ask to become the Wolfman, and therefore his fate becomes so much more tragic. Well, I think one of the things that appeals to me most is that they all have that vein of melancholy running through them. But for me, aside from the creature from the Black Lagoon, my tops would also be the Mummy and the Invisible Man. Wolfman is too much of a peeper for me to get into. There's a fun connection between the Wolfman and Creature from the Black Lagoon, even though the distance between those films in terms of years is substantial. Evelyn Ankers, who plays the romantic interest in the Wolfman, was married to 
one of our lead actors, Richard Denning. You'll find a lot of those intertwining threads throughout the history of Universal, horror movies in particular, but throughout the early days of Universal in general. But as far as the monster movies go, with varying degrees of success, I think Dracula suffers the most from its stage roots and being right on the cusp of the sound era. They all have such great atmosphere and tension. The eternal longing of the mummy, the great lab equipment in Frankenstein, the invisible man's frenzied mania, Dwight Fry and Edward Van Sloan are indispensable underappreciated contributors. Lugosi and Karloff are the undisputed kings of early horror. Lantern favorite James Whale turning in classic after classic. And then this one, which started the whole thing for me. It starts with the blast of that three-note discordant motif that Herman Stein came up with that is unforgettable, creating one of the most signature themes in monster movie history. Hans Salter and a young Henry Mancini in his apprenticeship years also made significant contributions to the score. For years in the beginning, so many of Universal's horror films opened with the strains of Swan Lake, so much so that that became a signature as well, but none of the other individual monsters have a piece that is so immediately identifiable as their theme as this is. I think the opening narration establishes that we're in for something truly great with no less a start than in the beginning. We're talking about the very formation of the earth here. As the narrator goes on to describe our transformation from aquatic-based animals to when we grew legs, the single shot of from the sea to upright is my favorite thing. It looks so beautiful. It reminds me quite a bit of I Walked with a Zombie. Do you know why you only see the one set of footprints in that scene? I don't. Because that's when the creature from the Black Lagoon was carrying you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my lord. You totally roped me in with that one. Speaking of my lord, isn't it odd though how they mix the creation with the science in this opening monologue for you? It definitely is. And if I had been a younger person, I'm not sure exactly what I would have made of that. Or if I would have just been along for the ride. To me, though, ultimately, it speaks to the age, which, cinematically at least, is kind of muddy science. There are a whole lot of hybrids going on in this, and that is definitely one of those things where they're in a transitional period, let's say. It makes me think of the odd place in the pantheon that the creature occupies. This one did come, like you said, much later than the initial foundation of Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, for instance. Over two decades later, in fact. It was produced in the atomic era, but it's a decidedly unatomic monster. It's a throwback in both the style of the creature and the monochrome of the presentation, so I think it fits nicely with those 30s films. It separates itself, though, in that he is the only one of the monsters that wasn't human first. It turns all those other films on their heads because he's an evolutionary step. He's moving toward his humanity while all the other monsters are moving away from theirs. They all began as human and became less so through transformation, curse, reassembly from other human pieces. He is a missing link, however, crawling from the primordial Devonian sea to become amphibian, to walking upright, to developing a crush on Julie Adams, and teaching us all once again that indeed humans are the real monsters here. I'm a huge fan of Atomic Age sci-fi. We've talked about that many times on the show. And I like this because, as you mentioned, the creature is not an accident. He wasn't the subject of a lab experiment gone awry or radiation, for example. So this feels so different from other things happening at the period. And all kidding aside about him carrying me as our lord... The legend is that he is godlike or possibly a god. So we've also got that element of the Americans running into their own superstitions or as they look down on the folklore, the traditions of other cultures and call those superstitions. Well, after the Big Bang settles down, we find ourselves in the Amazon and they make the discovery of this petrified claw. And there's a claw in the water that's not petrified, but petrifying We get a glimpse of the monster within the first three minutes. A little unusual for Universal Monsters. Usually they are a little slower burn with their reveal. But they spent $12,000 on this creature design. 
and adjusted for inflation, that's about 110000 of today's dollars. So I'm sure they wanted to get the mileage out of it. I think you see every penny on the screen. This is a beautiful design. It feels like it was so well thought out for every angle, every ray of light that might capture it. It's definitely no man in a gill man suit. At least it doesn't feel that way to me. How about you? No, definitely not. And when you watch how it moves underwater during the swimming sequences in particular, it's incredibly striking. It is such a beautiful design. And the person that's primarily responsible for that design, that's Millicent Patrick. This was one of my favorite discoveries in doing the research for this film. She was responsible for the design that we ultimately are all familiar with, but Bud Westmore took credit for that for over 50 years. For decades, he insisted that he was the sole designer of that creature. Can I jump in here first and talk a little bit about the Westmore family? Sure. This is also one of the things I absolutely love about being a cinephile. And that is making all of these different connections. I started noticing from a very early age, because of these period films that I watched, that I would see those same names popping up in the credits all the time. If you pay attention, you'll see Cedric Gibbons all over the place, Douglas Shearer, and very probably one of the many members of the Westmore makeup family. Even just in the last three films that you and I have watched this week, all featured a Westmore. The generation that we know the best, even though I will say they are still operating, are the six brothers, and that's Ern, Wally, Purse, Monty, Frank, and Bud. Evidently, they were quite scandalous, though I can't find a lot of specific stories, but it seems to have mainly featured alcohol, competition, and romantic partnerships. Now back to Bud Westmore, he was the makeup department head for the film. But I don't really want to talk anymore about him, I want to get right to Millicent Patrick. Well I figured you would, because I know that she did work on some of your favorite films. She made masks for one of your all-time favorites, The Mole People. She worked on This Island Earth. One of our shared favorites, It Came From Outer Space. And she created many other great designs. Until Bud Westmore threw a fit and stopped hiring her. The studio, for its publicity, and because she played such a key role in the development of this design, featured her in the angle of the beauty who created the beast. Bud Westmore could not handle this. It seems like first and foremost because she was a woman above all things. Second, definitely because it seemed like he wanted to keep all the credit for himself. Millicent Patrick on her own was a really fascinating person. She was an actress and a model for many years. She's credited as the first female animator at Disney, which is a huge thing. And she was also fairly mysterious. There's actually no definitive record of her birth date, her life, her death, or her whereabouts beyond 1980. So officially, the Screen Actors Guild lists her among the missing. Through all of this, though, Westmore did get the upper hand in the end, and he stopped using her on his team. And I think it also, for a very long time, as you mentioned, muddled her legacy and her creations through all of these other films. So I'm glad that now we can really shine a light back on her. Now, Millicent Patrick really brought this design to life, but the creators of the film have some credit for this, too. The whole idea came from the producer William Allen, whom I will have more to speak of later on. He heard a story at an Orson Welles dinner party about a race of half-men, half-fish creatures reportedly living in the Amazon. He worked with the film's director, Jack Arnold, on this, and Arnold came up with one of the initial ideas, all inspired by his Academy Award and what that Oscar might look like if you put a guild head on it. Instead, we got to see what it would look like if you put a guild head on Anne Sheridan, as it turns out. That's true. The oomph girl looks pretty good that way. The first experimental casts of the head were done using a life mask of Anne Sheridan, which is the only one that Universal Studios had that had a neck attached to it. A helpful thing to achieve that shot that we see of the gills moving in the big finale. What if Universal had had a head and neck of, say, Maury Amsterdam? (laughs) Buddy Hackett, a life mask of Buddy Hackett. We modeled the creature design on this life mask of Eddie Deason. (laughs) 
man, you're on a roll today. Oh, speaking of on fire, this thing moves at lightning speed. At 76 minutes long, it has to. No sooner have we found the fossil and the expedition has been funded than the creature strikes in the tent. I always felt like this scene was reminiscent of the first attack in The Mummy. There's this terrifying sound, this pig squeal mixtape that is apparently the voice of the creature from the Black Lagoon. You mentioned how amazing the actual music is, and yes, these sounds are incredible. It's a growl and a roar, pure fury. And there are shifting shadows and the screams of the victims. The iconic status of this film really does hinge on the creature. The plot is not exactly boundary-breaking. And as we see in this scene, there are pieces of previous universal scares that get recycled. There are clear nods to King Kong and other ethnographic thrillers of the day and all the baggage that comes along with those when you're dealing of the clash of the primitive versus the modern. Definitely the wigs on the assistant workers are nothing to be proud of. Well, after you spend $12,000, you don't have a lot left over in the budget, maybe? Apparently, maybe 40 cents. I think the rest of that budget went to the styling of Julie Adams. Because our two male leads who are vying for attention, they're supposed to be our hunks, not to me, they're mostly shirtless. So instead, Julie Adams in the Amazon has many different outfits. How long do you think that they told her to pack for with all the outfits that she's breaking out? And I guess she also brought an iron and a steamer the whole time too. I paid attention to her styling in a way that I don't normally, and I thought back to our Cloak and Dagger episode. And we had Brian and Cela Douglas on, and Cela really focused on the costume design and the color choices, and I thought that was so interesting. So here, even though we only have black and white, we can't focus on the dynamics of color so much, but there is a great deal that's done here with contrast. There is definitely the application of the blinding virginal white when it comes to the bathing suit, for instance. Absolutely, and I want to make sure to mention that when we come there. I won't bore you with every single scene breakdown, which I actually did in my notes. But she's really saying something when she mixes light and dark, or focuses on neutrals, or has all white. Well, the thing that I noticed, the thing that's most obvious here when it comes to these men vying for her attention... Things are tense from the word go between these guys for reasons that I can't even quite put my finger on in some cases. Their motivations seem to shift at will. Or they seem to have backup motivations at any given point. If sexual jealousy is not quite enough, there's also money versus science. Or if that's not enough, it's just to prove myself. It was tempting to look at this as Jack Arnold's commentary on the director-producer relationship, but I can't vouch 100% for the fact that that's what he's saying. But there is this constant underlying rumble of bickering and at each other's throats in some cases, practically, that goes on from the minute they decide to undertake this expedition until they actually reach the Amazon to discover that the creature has struck. And I love this scene when they discover this grisly tableau in the tent and how the victim's hand sticks up from the bottom of the frame, mimicking the creature's claw. And it's in a horrible state of rictus. We have our first close call with Julie Adams and the creature, who always seems to happen to know when the men are distracted and she is free for the taking. This tension continues to build as they go through the process of excavation and analysis of this fossil field. They find nothing, and so it is so far a waste of money and time, and frustration levels are reaching their apex. Which left me asking at this point, what is the most important thing to Mark? Is it his ambition? Why do these guys never seem to learn? There is a direct line that stretches from the beginning of cinema through this all the way through up to the shape of water in which these clods can't simply see the value of a thing they have in their hand. They always have this urge to destroy. And then generally in these movies, there's going to be the role of the kind of neutered scientist. That's the person arguing for, no, we need to research this thing, not kill it. That scientist is played by Whit Bissell, one of my favorites, as is Nestor Paiva, who is the boat pilot. And Richard Carlson, who is David, Kay's love interest, the direct antagonist to Mark, 
They all have these awesome connections to MST3K movies. Mystery Science Theater 3000, possibly my single favorite thing ever created, maybe, that's including 19th century French art, brought me to so many of these films and so many of these actors. In fact, the sequel to this is one of those that you're mentioning, right? Revenge of the Creature. I may have even seen it before I saw this film. Featuring in Pearl's words the stunningly annoying John Agar... Nestor Paiva comes back for that. He's also in my favorite, Mole People. Whit Bissell, you may have known him from I Was a Teenage Werewolf. Richard Carlson in Tormented, I could go on and on and on, but I won't. But also, again, because of the period, William Allen produced a lot of these things as well. And you will see that same story again and again and again, as you mentioned, of when will these people learn? Well, these things have become a trope for a reason, right? And I generally assume that the reason is because they're rooted in truth, or they would be summarily rejected and we would move on to the next idea. So what was true for audiences at the time? Where was their allegiance supposed to lie? And one reason I ask is because this was a new, young, exciting type of scientist. Not a bunch of graybeards in lab coats like filmgoers were used to. These scientists had shirtless underwater knife fights in short shorts, straight off the cover of men's adventure magazines. So that had to be geared to be appealing and exciting, right? To get you on their side? Does it speak to that sort of boys' adventure period? I'm the wrong person to ask, because I always sided with the monster, period. The misunderstood outsider. But did audiences in 1954 do that? Played upon and underscored and fed fears, I guess? To me, this plays like another instance of human interlopers, which makes the monster infinitely more sympathetic. It's like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre when Leatherface is sitting there whacking his head trying to figure out what are all these people doing in my house? These guys are dicks. I don't like these quote-unquote heroes. I didn't like them then. I like them even less now. They convey a particular strain of lantern-jawed Americanism that you find in bullies everywhere. And most of all, they are terrible scientists. I miss the days of the Greybeards when at least one of them was saying something reasonable. There's the last living relic of the Devonian Age. A true missing link. Let's kill it. Something that you said earlier I do want to follow up on. This was something I wrote about and have been thinking about, especially since we watched The Shape of Water the other day. I totally understand and relate to what you said about relating more to the monster. Feeling sympathy or empathy for the monster. Where that ends entirely for me, though, is with the women in peril angle. Good, because I wanted to ask you about this. I have a couple of particular things in mind, but I want to see where you're going here. I guess first off, before we go into anything else, do you mean it makes you feel no sympathy for the monster, or it makes you feel no sympathy for anyone involved? It's more of the latter. I certainly don't relate to the woman being forced to stay on the sidelines because when I was a kid, I never wanted to do that, and I certainly don't want to do it now. I also can't stand to watch really annoying, terrible things like when she falls down for no reason. But it's mainly the idea that this has any kind of romantic underpinnings. The relationship with the creature. Right. I don't ascribe tender feelings from him for her. And I don't mean that from the standpoint of, well, he's not a man, so we can't anthropomorphize those sorts of feelings. It's more like he is a stalker. He is a violent, true predator who sees her as prey. And I saw it written about time and time again in all of these people who were looking to pick up the mantle of this potential reboot of this film, talked about the romance. Guillermo del Toro talked about fulfilling the romance. A romance that to you is non-existent. Absolutely. It definitely succeeds in The Shape of Water for me. I thought that was absolutely tremendous. And I think mostly because the woman is the person who is making the choice. I would qualify that with one other thing. That beautiful shot. It is mesmerizing and haunting where she is swimming on the surface and he is mirroring her movements from below. It's beautiful, but it's unsettling because the key element of that scene for me is her ignorance of his presence. There's only one active participant in this water ballet, and that pushes his behavior 
as you said, into the realm of stalker. If you're attributing human motivation to him, if you're on the side that suggests he's still more animal than man, then, again, like you mentioned, predator-prey interaction. Now, I have officially on the show come out against stalking, so I'm pretty famous for that, and I stand by that. And that still is, along with you, my favorite sequence in the film. Cinematically, it's just incredibly beautiful and skin-crawlingly terrifying to watch. So 50s sci-fi horror heroines were stuck with a bunch of duds on land and in the water. It's true. And Richard Denning and Richard Carlson, no offense, they are the duddiest of the duds to me. This does bring me to another thing I wanted to mention. Following that women in peril subgenre, there's a great YouTube video called Monsters Love Carrying Chicks. And at least surprisingly to me, Often those women in peril are actual scientists in the film. And this brings me to the idea of women scientists as sidekicks. So in this film, Kay talks about the training that she's had. Ostensibly, that would make her at least not necessarily an equal, but a really handy assistant. But we don't see much of that. And that follows along with other films of the period like Tarantula, also directed by Jack Arnold or them, when these women scientists who are often even doctors have these huge blind spots and will often receive a key piece of knowledge or the solution from some untrained man. Or to flip that, miss that piece of knowledge completely, jeopardizing everyone. That carried all the way through to the Andromeda strain. Again, talking about these different things that we've watched this week... I was watching a film called The Kid Glove Killer from the 40s. The female criminalist in this is playing a key role in the police laboratory. And in the same breath as she's talking about having worked for her master's degree, she says that science is no job for a woman. It's infuriating to modern me, and I would like to think it would have been infuriating to me back then, too. Well, like most films of its ilk from that period, it's a mixed bag when it comes to those things. And I do want to come back to some of these things when we get to that point in the film's chronology. Where I have us right now, though, is entering the lagoon for the first time. And they are experiencing another world. And that world is Florida. (laughs) Most of it was shot on the Universal Backlot, with some sequences in various parts of Florida, including the underwater sequences, shot in Wakula Springs, which is now a swimming hole with cabins for rent, so you can stay and swim at the actual Black Lagoon. How cool is that? When are we going? As soon as possible. Unfortunately, that does mean we have to go to Florida. (laughs) I'm kidding, Florida. I love you. What I love here about the trip into the lagoon itself is that this big old boat has to shove its way through this narrow opening of the lagoon. (laughs) And they have to use their spears literally to get through, including Mark holding up a big spear gun against his belly and shooting it off. Well, the thing I like about it is probably a little less symbolic than that. And it's the first underwater exploration. We get our first look at the creature's face and all the cool obligatory 3D tricks. That first time that we see the creature is watching but nobody can tell, that's a good jump scare. Now 3D was how I saw this the very first time. Have you seen it that way? I haven't. I've seen a handful of 3D films, but not this one. Okay, well we have the Blu-ray 3D version, so we need to get some glasses for you. This is the section where we do see her for the first time in that fully white bathing costume. So based on what you're saying about the boat forcing its way into the lagoon and now her virginal outfit, is this a wedding night metaphor that we're seeing here? Their first trip to the lagoon? Is this a honeymoon? Quite possibly. Also possibly virginal for the creature itself. This is the underwater ballet part because, as you mentioned earlier, She makes this incredibly stupid decision with what we know, which is to explore the lagoon on her own. So she is offering herself up and he is ready to take her. Do you want to talk about how our honeymoon was in 3D? I don't even begin to know what that means. Anyway, this film arrived at the tail end of the golden era of 3D, and it remains one of the most pivotal and successful 3D films of all time, right up there with House of Wax, for instance. Notably, it's the only stereoscopic film to also have a 3D sequel. 
And I think the thing that's most interesting about it, which is most obvious in these sections, is the 3D process and the way they used it for this film. So much of it, unlike every other 3D film, is underwater. And so the tried and true methods of filming this were not going to work in this instance, and they had to rig special cameras. And as opposed to other 3D movies where they fling everything but the kitchen sink at your face, the focus for the creature from the Black Lagoon was on depth and distance in these underwater shots. And this blew my mind when I was six years old. My parents were very indulgent with this. In addition to ordering me every book that I wanted to from the weekly reader form that I mentioned, and going without things because of that, they also drove 60 miles to get me glasses at a 7-Eleven, because the first time I saw it, KOKH TV 25 on your UHF dial was where it was playing. But they were based in Oklahoma City, which was an hour's drive away. And the 3D glasses promotion that they were doing only reached so far. But they got their hands on some for me, and it was a life-changing experience. Aside from the creature, the other great thing that this experience brought into my life was Count Gregor. I had two horror hosts that I grew up with. Dr. Digby was one. And he was the one that was closer to home and worked at a smaller regional ABC affiliate. Turns out, he's a convicted sex offender and pedophile, so we're not going to dwell on Dr. Digby for a long time. But the big one, though, was Count Gregor, and he is a legend in broadcasting. Well, Count Gregor's real name is John Ferguson, and 60 years ago, he started as a villain on an Oklahoma City children's television show and has been a staple of Oklahoma broadcasting ever since. And I'm assuming that you saw him from a very young age. As early as I can remember watching television, I was watching Count Gregor. Were these late night films or were they matinees? I remember we had a similar thing when I was a kid, but it was during the day. I was going to ask you about that. If you had horror hosts in your neck of the woods, do you specifically remember any? You know, I really don't. And that may be because we didn't have one. The one thing that I remember was a show that we had called Matinee at the Bijou. That was a PBS thing, right? It seems like we had that too. It was. I always thought it was a regional thing, but maybe it wasn't. But I know that that was my mom's favorite. I remember it because it was a whole lot of Roy Rogers movies, which even then I was not into. So I feel like I missed out on this fun. Well, it was some afternoon matinee stuff, but most of my encounters with Count Gregor were late, late movies. And he was doing it from long before when I started watching. The first time he performed as Count Gregor was in 1958, and that was when they were rolling out those shock theater packages to regional markets where they had repackaged all of those original Universal monster movies. And that's what really revitalized interest in them the first time around. His programs had various names throughout the years, Nightmare Theater, Sleepwalkers Matinee. I think the thing I watched most often was called Scare Country Theater. And there were wacky bits and host segments in between the horror movies, including some zany locations and participants. I wanted to ask you about that because I feel like you showed me a clip, and I'm not sure if it's Count Gregor, but I definitely remember people in a hot tub. It was definitely Count Gregor. It was basically the sales department of the television station, and the girls from whatever local, regional beauty pageant had taken place that weekend at the Holiday Inn. It was basically Herb Tarlick from WKRP in Cincinnati and Miss Dr. Pepper Boat Show, alongside Count Gregor in the Hotel Jacuzzi. He finally hung up his cape in 1988, but still occasionally does appearances here and there, which officially, technically, makes him the longest-running horror host in the world. That is super cool. He really was the best. He was folksy and charming, and he never took himself too seriously. He showed the best, worst movies, and he had a great time, and he made sure that we had a great time as well. But not to drift too far afield in my reverie for Afternoons Gone By, chronologically in the movie, we are still basically right here at the point where she is swimming in the lagoon. And to begin with, it was not a smart choice, and they point that out as the boat has to come to her. And because she's essentially set herself up as bait, unknowingly, the boat has the net out and the creature gets caught in the net. This wreaks all kinds of havoc. The boom starts to split. The winch is going to break down. And then finally, the net comes up with a giant hole in it. Not just a hole. There is one of his claws lodged in the net, which initiates this entire argument yet again of study, not trophies, catch, not kill. 
but we soon have our very first encounter face to face with the creature. Now, I haven't seen this in 3D, unfortunately, yet, hopefully someday. But it definitely looks like that moment when they're underwater and we see all of the bubbles coming at us, I think that that would have been a really neat effect. It's beautiful even without the 3D. All of that underwater stuff is fantastic to look at for the depth, like I mentioned. So many things in the foreground, so many things in deep focus in the background. That mesmerizing scene where she is the bait and it's the whole love to touch, mustn't touch. The underwater photography in this thing is really fantastic. Coming back again to what you had mentioned about this continuing argument of do we kill it, do we study it? They also seem to suggest that if we just leave it alone, it won't bother us. And yet this idea that someone is always going to kick that anthill. And that might have been true before he saw Julie Adams, but it's hard to keep him down on the farm once they've seen that white bathing suit. You know, I was thinking a lot today about King Kong. And not to harp on this idea again, but that last line really lives with me. It was beauty killed the beast. No, it wasn't. It was capitalism. It was a ravenous press. It was putting something where it had no business being and then blaming it on the lady. Even though, yeah, Kay does not make the smartest decisions in this film. And now, as you mentioned, this is the moment where they actually see him, the full creature. And they still managed to harpoon it in the back like a bunch of jerks. Now back on the boat, the process to try to get a photo of the gill man doesn't work. Nor do we find out, did the harpoon. They're still talking about trying to take it alive versus Mark wanting to fight him. I'm still not clear where his murderous hatred comes from. Well, he doesn't need yet another arrival for her affections. Good point. And that rival manages to get on the boat. As they're talking about a plan to drop massive quantities of a drug into the water in order to put him to sleep so that they can capture him, Kay tosses her cigarette and he's there. He is able to kill another of their team in the meantime, but gets back into the water before they can capture him. He's not able to escape the drug, though. He's severely affected by it, and stumbling through his grotto, his lair, he comes upon Julie Adams, but is overtaken by the drug and by David and Mark, Mark beginning to nearly club him to death with the butt end of his rifle. They capture him, and they cage him under the boat. No way this is going to work. I love that eerie shot of him peeking up from his cage, just waiting for his moment. That's a great section looking at that underwater prison of his as he watches us and bides his time. And he starts to test what looks to be bamboo that they put this little prison together with. Mark and David continue to fight about whether to leave immediately or to stay and study him while they still have time. And unfortunately, they leave Whit Bissell behind to stand guard. And here is where the most terrifying thing in the movie happens. Kay outlining her obligation in romantic relationships with these men. It is super gross and makes my skin crawl. We find out through the course of this conversation with Whit Bissell that she feels like, she flatly states, in fact, that she owes Mark some sort of romantic consideration because he's helped her with her career. This qualifies him as a suitor somehow. Or at the very least that she is unable to leave his employment or punch him in the face, I guess. It's always a bit of a fool's errand to try to hold these films to a contemporary standard. Films from 20, even 10 years ago, frequently fail these tests. So there's no way a 60-plus-year-old film will stand up to that kind of scrutiny, but we can still examine these things. It's a know-where-you've-been-so-you-know-where-you're-going kind of thing. And even though the second half, or at least the final third of this thing, is very much regressive, I come down that this is ultimately a mixed bag overall. Going back to when we first see her, she is piloting the boat. She is clearly in charge. Through conversation, we learn that she works at the Institute, so she's financially independent. Considering things in their own time and context and what was expected of women at the time, this seems notable. She displays a physical familiarity with these duds that implies agency and sexual confidence. We've obviously seen she swims when she damn well wants to. Of course, a lot of that is undone by the objectification being treated like a prize and the last act of her being carried around in a faint most of the time. 
But it's 1954, and you have to imagine how radical some of those things in the beginning were then. It's not the creature from the Woke Lagoon. It's part of a continuum. It's a good point, and it's something to consider because I know I've been mentioning it quite a lot during this episode. I talk a lot about my film-going history over the course of this podcast. I watched a lot of these films, 50s, 40s, 30s, 60s, 70s, all at the same time in my childhood. So there are definitely a lot of messages to try to cull through, and I know I certainly had a lot of questions at the time. I could have watched this, or even Revenge of the Creature, the sequel, where the female lead is an ichthyology student going after her master's. But she's definitely not in the position of power. The person who holds that is a full professor. I could have watched those two things in the same sitting and turn on the regular television to see a commercial for something like Anjali, which was the whole I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in a pan and never let him forget he's a man. <laughs> You're the total package. Why don't you wear that stuff? I should, and that lady was wearing the late 70s, early 80s lady blazer with the sort of string tie thing, if you remember, tied in a bow. I seem to remember her having nothing on underneath it. Uh, we should maybe talk about that in a different episode. <laughs> maybe that's just the impression that the advertising was trying to leave me with, because I was probably eight, so I wasn't paying attention to it in that way. But what were young people to make of this? You mentioned you saw this when you were very young. I wonder if baby Cole thought of any of those things. Knowing grown-up Cole, probably at least a little bit, maybe. Actually, I probably thought, no, I just want to be this creature to smash these guys. Probably. And that's also probably what I would have thought, too. So I'm totally with you on this as a continuum, and even if there are problematic issues in it, I do hope that young people still come to this and ask all of those questions. But thankfully, we don't have to hear any more cringing moments of Kay justifying her actions, because the Gill Man attacks Whit Bissell, and they both get horribly burned. The creature is able to get back in the water, though. And it's on now. He is mad. If he wasn't before, if they thought, oh, he'll just leave us alone if we don't bother him, that is now an option that has been taken off the table. And yet Mark and David still have to fight about it. They talk about, we didn't come here to fight with monsters, versus we're staying until we get him. Well, he doesn't leave them much choice, because now the creature lays a trap for them and blocks them into the lagoon where there is no escape. It reminded me a lot of that other truly remarkable film, Anaconda. <laughs> so they've got to clear away this trap, which means they've got to go into the water. There's a huge underwater fight, it's super cool, with the creature pulling Mark lower and lower into the water, and we know what's going to happen. He can't possibly sustain that pressure. I wondered if you felt this as well, because we were just in Oslo at the Vigeland Museum and Sculpture Park. There are several moments where the Gill Man is wrestling with Mark, and it looks like one of those sculptures of the lizard and the woman. There are those four pillars at the corner of the bridge in the sculpture park, and each one of them has a sea monster wrapped around a human being. And that's exactly what I thought when I saw those. Now, Mark is dead at this point, and David still can't get a line on the creature. Can't say I feel real bad about it. Mark had it coming. Before we go on too far from here, I did want to mention there's one neat little character moment for Nestor Paiva here that I really like. He still maintains this cheerful, affable boat pilot persona throughout while he has his knife at Mark's throat, showing him who really is boss here in the Amazon. He's a good guy, but he's been around. It's the one time when you see any of the characters of color actually assert themselves rather than just be Star Trek red shirts there to be dispatched by the creature. But he does it with such pleasant menace. Now they've got to turn to plan B. Plan B for murder. They're going to go back to the drug and put it in one of the air tanks in order to try to spray the creature. This is the plan straight out of a Three Stooges short. Poor Whit Bissell still can't get a break. He sees the claw coming in through the portal and has to alert Kay because he can't get away. He can't do anything. He can't speak. So he basically has to moan and roll around loudly. The spray idea does work. They are able to clear away the trap. But now the Gill Man is even more pissed than ever. 
and he's completely outsmarted them. His diversion works. As they are clearing the tree, he finally grabs Kay and jumps into the water, taking her away. That's a beautiful, fluid movement and a credit to the actor in the suit. I wanted to ask you here one last thing about the contradiction of these qualities. The creature has numerous instances where you are feeling sympathetic, where he is being wounded by these people, hunted by these people, through no fault of his own, and yet you cannot square that with his violent pursuit of the heroine. I don't know. Maybe I bought into what the movie was telling me too much. I feel like after he was the one who drew first blood, even though he was the one being encroached upon... I didn't really feel sorry for him at any point. So I think we keep coming back to this point where the monster to you is not nearly as sympathetic overall as he is to me. Definitely. I also don't feel sorry for Kay. I don't feel sorry for Mark or for David. I feel sorry for the workers who get killed. Creature from the Black Lagoon, unfair to Yeoman. I feel sorry for Whit Bissell because he got his face burned off. And now it's time for the big final showdown. David goes after them. Kay is just still passed out on a rock, it looks like. Not just passed out on a rock, but the way they have her displayed there is something else. Draped. Slung over. Splayed. We have this beautiful shot of the creature rising from the primordial fog in his lair. And he is manhandling David. He's throwing him around like a rag doll until... Mark's mentor and the boat pilot show up with their rifles and shoot the creature, holding him at bay long enough that the creature can stumble off back into the lagoon and sink into the murky depths. I guess this is where my sympathy finally shifted because I wrote down, they let him drown, basically, or at least die underwater. The end. Or is it? We'd soon find out that it wasn't. Two sequels followed in the universal style of running a monster franchise into the ground with a series of follow-ups of diminishing returns. Do you think this thing is ever going to get rebooted? It's been talked about so long. I think there's a chance. I think they're making an awful lot of noise about this dark universe. But everything we've seen from it has been terrible. I think it has officially been rebooted basically with The Shape of Water, and I am perfectly satisfied with that result. Me too. I was going to ask you if you thought, really, that film put paid to the whole reboot idea. Yeah, I think so. I think it makes it a moot point. Anything that follows after that, from all of the prospective treatments of the script that I've heard discussed, I don't think any of it's going to measure up to The Shape of Water. Because I don't think any of the filmmakers that could touch it would be genuinely a fan of it the way Del Toro is. So far, that hasn't stopped anybody involved with Spider-Man, so That's true, I guess. We'll oh, see. you've really got it in for Spider-Man. I do. I'm so tired of those damn movies, and I want them to stop. So we're at the end of the film. We've talked about a number of wonderful qualities that it has, and some other questionable issues that it goes into. It made me think that I really wanted to ask this time, have we explained why we really like it? Why you chose it? I think so, but I will reiterate just in case. I chose it because it was such a great experience for me as a kid. It's a fantastic building block. And it was a gateway to so many other things for me. The timeless appeal is the plight and the struggle of the monster for me. The perennial outsider who just wants to be left alone. Sound familiar? Every path I have trod since age six has had some of that in it. It's an idea I relate to most strongly. Even though he appeared on screen the least of all the Universal Monsters, the Gill Man holds a permanent special place in my heart. And P.S. He's the only Universal Monster that doesn't wear clothes. He is my kind of guy. You come barging into my house, you're going to find me with no pants on either. Take that, you pearl clutchers. But this isn't simply a nostalgia piece for you. You still want to watch it. I still want to watch it all the time, and like I mentioned, it is one of the greatest B-movies ever made. It belongs up there for a reason. It is a pivotal piece of cinema history. So ignore the Gill Man at your own peril. What about you? What is it that you enjoy about it? It's definitely not the two male leads. (laughs) I'm gonna guess that. But I am truly obsessed with anything underwater, and I could watch those sequences over and over and over again. I think it's a really fun adventure, and I like watching it play out. I don't know that it will ever rise above my other favorite universals, but it is a great ride, and it looks wonderful. And if for nothing else, it spawned the sequel, which spawned the MST3K episode, and for that I thank it.
Well, since you brought up the other universal monsters that you love so much, are one of those going to be your recommendation? Do you have your recommendation ready? I sure do. And it's going to put a big smile on your face. Okay, what you got? I chose the film that kicked off my love of the gorilla gonna kill you <laughs> genre. And that is Gorilla at Large, also from 1954. Directed by Harmon Jones with Anne Bancroft, Cameron Mitchell, Lee J. Cobb, and Raymond Burr. That's a powerhouse cast for a Gorilla Gonna Kill You movie. And I mentioned how great of a ride and how gorgeous Creature from the Black Lagoon is. I cannot say the same of either of those qualities for this film. But it does have a crazy creature design and a ridiculous dye job on Cameron Mitchell. It also takes place during Anne Bancroft's early femme fatale phase. It's about a potentially murderous gorilla, or is it a man in a gorilla suit, wreaking havoc and committing murder at a carnival. How about you? Well, quality-wise, I think I went down the same road as you, and I chose The Monster of Piedras Blancas from 1959, directed by Irvin Berwick. Starring Gene Carmen, Don Sullivan, and Les Tremaine, it was heavily influenced by The Creature from the Black Lagoon, and that is being diplomatic. Jack Keevan, who produced Piedras Blancas, had supervised the manufacture of the Gill Man suit for Creature, and the likeness is much more than coincidental. It was another case, much like Millicent Patrick, of someone not getting to flourish under Bud Westmore that needed to spread their wings. And Keevan struck out on his own for this one. It's about a lighthouse keeper who is surreptitiously feeding a prehistoric sea monster to keep it placated, but soon the monster is no longer satisfied with scraps and goes in search of more satisfying fare. If Creature from the Black Lagoon is a B picture, this is a C picture at best. I recommend it mainly as a curiosity or for completion purposes for monster movie aficionados. I will say I like the creature design, even though it's a jumble of borrowed pieces, basically. Some pieces that I think Millicent Patrick actually designed. The other thing I like about it, it displays an occasional shocking blast of violence. It's recommended if you wish the creature from the Black Lagoon had just started straight ripping off heads. So once again, that's two great recommendations. Gorilla at Large and the Monster of Piedras Blancas. And that brings us to the end of episode 72. First and foremost, this time around, I would like to say a special thanks to Tim and Leon from the podcast Yaga Day. They recently pledged to our Patreon and got us to our most current goal. We appreciate that so much. Thank you, guys. If you're curious about how the Patreon works, you can check out our most recent episode on Black Panther, the first time we've discussed a new release, over there for free because we've made that one free to everyone patron or not in celebration of hitting our latest goal. You can find that free episode and how to pledge all related information over at patreon.com slash magic lantern. Otherwise, if you would just like to get in touch with us, you could reach us via email at magic lantern podcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for magic lantern podcast in any of those places. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Tim Lego, the fine gentleman at FUDS on Film, Andy Wolverton, Jane Sankner, Brandon Claiborne, Matt Schlee, Matteo Boscarol, and Travis Trudell. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, just about anywhere that you find podcasts, you can find us there. If you would like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast.